Tech Revision with Mrs. Swanee Pooh. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, another video that's going to cover one of the key material areas that you need to know for the A-level theory and that is smart materials. Let's go. So smart materials are quite a unique um, group of materials. Um, in that they uh, react and change due to some kind of input. So for example, they could change, and what I mean by change is they could um, physically change in terms of they could change shape, they could change colour, they could change transparency. Um, lots of different things can happen to them, um, but this is always to do with an input. So they may change due to heat, they may change um, due to exposure to UV light um, or due to electrical or physical input. So electric current or a physical input by pushing or pulling. So on the left hand side of this uh, slide, you can see that these are the smart materials that you need to have an awareness of. So we've got shape memory alloys. Um, so nitinol or nitinol or however you say it is uh, an example of a shape memory alloy, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then we've got a range of different pigments, <clears throat> thermochromic uh, or thermochromatic, uh, phosphorescent and photochromic pigments, electroluminescent wire and piezoelectric material. It could be piezo or piezo. I'm not honestly uh, too sure. I think it just depends on how you pronounce it. So those are the materials you need to know. Uh, let's talk each of those through. So shape memory um, alloy. These alloys are made from nickel and titanium and the really clever things about these is that um, they have a memory. They can remember what shape they um, were in and with the input of heat they actually spring back to that shape. So this actually gives, you might be thinking, well, well what different applications um, are there for this type of um, material or uh, properties? There's actually quite a few um, and I'm going to talk through a few of those in a second. So um, the SMA, the shape memory alloy uh, wire is heat treated. So it is um, bent into a particular shape, say the shape of this glasses frame that you can see in front of you. Um, and it's heat treated at that shape. So heated to a particular temperature um, and then that is almost like set in its memory. So if you were to then scrunch up these glasses that you can see, um, in front of uh, in front of you, the, this sort of like picture that I've got there, um, and then at um, room temperature or at another type of temperature, um, they will suddenly spring back to the shape that they have remembered. So it's a very very useful property to have. There are lots of different applications. So these Memoflex uh, glass glasses <coughs> have shape memory alloy to uh, help them spring back to their shape in case they are bent or anything like that. Um, I absolutely love this picture. It's hilarious. Uh, he's supposed to be injecting that into the artery in the groin, but uh, I just thought it was really funny, so I've included it. But basically, um, this is where shape memory alloys have uh, applications in medicine. So for example, if you had a damaged or a crushed artery, um, SMA tubing can be inserted, so shape memory alloy tubing could be inserted into the artery um, and once the, the body warms up that shape memory alloy it can expand and actually open up and push out the walls of that collapsed um, artery. So you can see that um, that's a massive uh, medical advantage you're not having to put anything mechanical in the body. The material is just doing that by itself. Uh, this one also a bit of a gross picture. I do apologize, but um, it's often used in braces. So um, in dentistry, so they often use shape memory alloy uh, as the wire between the different fixings on a brace. Um, because when the heat in the body warms that wire up, it remembers that it was actually shorter. So it goes in in like a stretched uh, state. So it's stretched by 5%. Then when the, when the material is heated up, it gets shorter. Therefore, it's putting pressure on the teeth um, and actually pulling them gently into the shape that they should be. 
Um, that's why if any of you have ever had braces, you get that kind of aching because basically your teeth are being constantly pulled by that wire trying to return back to its shape. So that is shape memory alloy. Right, the next ones are um, different pigments. Um, so they react to different types of input. So this one reacts to heat. It's kind of obvious, it's in the name. Thermochromic uh, or thermochromatic pigments. Um, they're quite often incorporated into a film, um, so a really thin piece of plastic um, that will change colour in reaction to heat. So you can see this sheet here that once you put your hands on it, it changes colour, it's reacting to the heat in your hands <coughs> and you get a change of colour uh, on the sheet. Um, sometimes it can be generated by an electric, uh, an electric current just because um, the, uh, what's the word, the resistance, there we go, the resistance on the wire generates heat which warms up the film and there you go, you get the, the bright colours. Again, trying to think of applications for this pigment. Um, there's different ones. Um, some of the, the, the really clever ones, the batteries that you can actually just push <coughs> on the outside of the battery. And what happens is the current um, between those two points, when you push, it heats up the strip, which indicates how much power there is left in the battery life. So the film reacts to the amount of heat generated by the battery, which therefore indicates how much power um, is left. Um, this one I didn't know about. So on frozen goods, the, the film on the outside of the packaging, if the product has stayed frozen throughout its journey, it will still say that it's OK. So that you can you can see that it hasn't gone below uh, that frozen state. But if the product defrosted slightly, the OK would be blurred or would disappear. So that's quite a good way of keeping track of temperature changes, as well as things like thermometers for uh, babies. These could be pushed to the baby's forehead rather than trying to <coughs> put a thermometer into a baby's mouth or under an armpit or anything like that, which can be quite difficult. <coughs> Excuse me. So phosphorescent pigments. Um, do not ask me what that picture is on the top right. I have got absolutely no, no idea, but this slide is quite useful because phosphorescent materials, they glow in the dark. So it's glow in the dark um, paints. These have phosphorescent pigments in it. So they were developed to replace actually um, in the good old days, the glow in the dark watch faces um, were actually made with radioactive uh, elements and phosphorescent um, pigments. So these were designed as a safer um, alternative. They are ceramic based and they absorb light energy in the day. And then when it's dark, they uh, readmit this when it's dark. So they let the light out in the dark. Um, I'm sure all of you have had toys that <clears throat> like little glow in the dark uh, toys that when it's night, you can see them glowing away. They are available in things like powder form. So quite often they can be mixed with paints. Um, I had someone in GCSE once use a glow in the dark paint to put on their final product. Um, and you can see them on things like stickers for children's walls, moons and stars on the ceiling. Um, and also different applications like uh, fishing lures to uh, catch fish, but meaning that the, the fisherman or fisher lady, fish person, fisher person can actually see the, uh, you know, the end of the line when they're fishing in the dark. Some of the other applications um, are like uh, warning signs and uh, exit signs. So if suddenly the light was lost in the building or it was dark, these would light up. Um, I know that in an aircraft, if it plunges into darkness, they use phosphorescent pigments on the floor to show a quick exit um, out of the aircraft. And sometimes they're used on things like watches and what, um, you know, on the, uh, the, what are they called? The hands, the hands of the watch, okay, to make them light up in the dark if you're trying to see your watch. Okay, so that's phosphorescent pigments. They take in energy, light energy during the day and re-emit it at night, glow in the dark. Right. This one is photochromic pigments, and you may uh, think, oh, it's light. It is light, uh, specifically UV. 
So photochromic pigments react to UV light. Um, so when they are exposed to UV light, uh, they change colour. Some uses for these, the classic use for these is transition lenses, which used to be really fashionable in like the 90s. Um, my husband, when I first met him, uh, had transition lenses, which was kind of odd, actually. He sort of looked like a little old man, bless him. But it means a pair of glasses that uh, when you go outside into the sunlight, the UV will uh, make them go dark, which means uh, it's protecting your eyes. It basically creates almost like a pair of sunglasses, um, but within the same product. So you don't have to have a separate pair of sunglasses you can still have your prescription lens uh, glasses and they will transition and change, go darker when exposed to UV light. Also things like uh, self-darkening car windows to protect children from UV light in the back of cars. It's quite an interesting one. Quite often they're used on children's clothing. Um, this one's actually really clever. To, to, so when the UV light is too intense, um, something would maybe light up and it would instruct the parent to put more uh, sunblock on or something. And sometimes it's just used for decorative. You know, when the sun comes out, a fun pattern comes out on a, on a, uh, a piece of clothing, which can be quite uh, entertaining. So photochromic pigments react to UV light. Right, just a couple more. This one, um, I really like this stuff. It's called electroluminescent wire, uh, shortened to EL wire sometimes. Um, and it's kind of uh, competes with traditional LED strips. So those strips that you can buy off Amazon where you can change the colors and all sorts of different things. This stuff is a little bit different. It, um, it produces 360 degrees of light because the entire wire lights up. Um, and I'll explain how that happens in a moment. So rather than having LEDs that shine out in particular directions, this stuff lights up in all different directions. Um, it's also really flexible, meaning you can attach it onto clothing, you can wear it, you can attach it to moving parts, bend it into any shape you desire. Um, and basically what happens when a current um, of electricity is passed through this wire, um, <clears throat> it causes it to glow. That's because it is um, coated in a layer of phosphor. So remember from phosphorescent um, pigments, those pigments glow, okay, they let out light. So these, um, this phosphor generates photons basically with the, with the, you know, a reaction with the electrical current and that causes it to glow. So a very small electric current just from a battery pack can actually cause this entire wire to light up and glow. So um, quite often used for decorative um, applications. Some of you may have uh, dog collars and dog leads um, that light up like this at night because, um, you know, to help you identify your dog and things in the, in the uh, night. But this stuff, like I said, is, is quite often used for uh, decorative purposes. But it's quite interesting that it produces that light from an electric current, but it's not a bulb. It's actually a like a chemical that reacts and glows. So that's that stuff, electroluminescent wire. Last one, uh, piezoelectric materials. Uh, these ones are really interesting. Basically, they produce electricity when they are compressed. So when they are placed under mechanical stress, that sounds really complicated. It just means squashed or pushed together or uh, compressed. So, um, for example, a pressure sensor, the bottom right hand side, that is actually a piezo electric um, pressure sensor that when you press onto it it creates an electric current so it's quite an interesting material because you don't need a battery you don't need um, anything else apart from this piezoelectric material that just naturally generates small amounts of elect electricity by itself um, that's the slight downside of it it only produces small amounts of electric charge um, but that can be enough to, uh, you know, to power small switches and uh, decorative items. Um, but there's lots and lots of uses for, for this type of material. And because no external power so source is needed, it makes it really flexible. It means you can put it anywhere um, and the, the materials can be constructed into a, like a wide variety of shapes and sizes. 
and not having to worry about a battery that needs to be maybe replaced and things like that um, is a massive benefit. So I once had an A-level student who was going to use this kind of technology in um, a project of theirs, which was going to be a dance floor that had piezoelectric materials in it so that when the crowd um, at like a gig or a festival are jumping up and down, um, you know, to a song or dancing, the actual motion of them jumping up and down uh, creates electric charge and that could be harnessed and used in some way that they're actually generating their own power. Could it power the lights around the, the festival or something like that? So there's lots of opportunities for this kind of material. Um, I think it's really interesting, but, but there we go. So those are the different types of smart materials that you need to know. I hope that was useful and I will see you on the next one.